Okay, so the final section here is on software. So I guess the first question you know you might reasonably ask is you know why software? Okay, why? I mean, hopefully I've convinced you, uh, nothing else, that uh, you know cryptography, access control, protocols, those are important security topics, and I think you know it's fairly obvious those are important topics. But what about software? You know, the way to think about it is that software is the foundation, right, on which you're building all these other things. Okay, so I don't care how good, you know, the structure of your house is, if your foundation's rotten, your house is going to fall over, right? And that's really what it comes down to. Okay, so we're building all that other stuff in software. All your, all your cryptography is written in software. All your protocols are written in software. All the access control stuff is in software. So if an attacker can go directly to the software and do some damage, okay, it doesn't matter how good those other things are. Uh, okay, that's really what this says, okay? It's the foundation for uh, essentially all of the uh, security uh, that we've talked about, okay? So we need to think about it at least. And I like this quote uh, here a lot. So uh, you see this in a lot of different forms, but if automobiles had followed the same development cycle as computers, a Rolls Royce today would cost $100, get a million miles per gallon, and explode once a year, killing everyone inside. Yeah, so that's really a, a comment about uh, reliability of software, but you know, bugs and reliability and those things, as we'll see, have a really close connection to uh, to security. So. Uh, okay, so bad software. Okay, you guys know about this. You're all Windows users, right? You know about bad software. So, okay, so. No, uh, just kidding. Okay, so, okay, so. Uh, there's lots of examples out there, okay, of bad software. These are just a few, you know, it's not hard to find these things. Um, and NASA, uh, I think in the 90s, they built this uh, Mars lander. So uh, I actually saw an IMAX film on this. It was really nice. I think it was probably produced by NASA or somebody. It's kind of a propaganda film. But it was really cool because, um, you know, the Mars atmosphere is very thin. So they have these huge chutes that have to open up to lower this thing down onto the surface of Mars. And it was tricky because they had to open at just the right time. You know, they had to open early enough so that it would slow it down enough before it hit the surface, not smash into a million pieces, but not too early or be you know, sort of lost in space <laughs> out there. Um, so uh, it had all these, oh, it was really cool. You know, it had all these you know, inflatable bags around the thing. And when it hit the surface, it bounced along until it you know, finally settled down somewhere, even with all those chutes. You know, you could barely slow it down enough. Anyway, it was critical to open it at the right, uh, right point in time. Well, okay, they, the first time they tried this, does anybody know what happened? It crashed. It smashed into a billion pieces. And why did it crash? Because the chutes didn't open in time. Why did the chutes not open in time? They had two different groups of people working on this, and one group thought you know, they were using metric units of measure, and one people thought they were using English units of measure, and somehow they never communicated that to each other, so the students did not. It was a software bug, okay? So it uh, cost you know, nothing for the government, $165 million, you know, pocket change. Okay, so. uh, another interesting example, uh, the Denver airport. Uh, this was a big thing like in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, something like that. Uh, and they had this baggage handling system, which was extremely sophisticated. Okay, it was get your bags wherever they were supposed to go all over the airport. And of course, it's all controlled by software, right? Well, you know, software being software, you know, they didn't get the software done uh, in time to thoroughly test it. So like a week before the airport scheduled open, they finally have it done, right? And they're ready to test. And they tested it, and the bags ended up all over the place and destroyed and damaged. You know, it was just a, it was a disaster. So they couldn't open the airport because they didn't have any way to get the bags where they were supposed to go. So they had to delay the opening of the airport by uh, 11 months at a cost of something like $1 million a day. Okay, you add that up, it adds up to a, a lot of money. So, and this is all sort of blamed on software. So, uh, so what do you suppose happened to this person who was in charge of this uh, project? Fire. Executed. <laughs> uh, even worse, uh, this person became Secretary of Transportation in the Clinton administration. Got the ultimate promotion you know, for somebody in this field, I guess. So. Uh, another interesting software example is uh, this uh, Osprey uh, aircraft, uh, military uh, aircraft, used mostly by the Marine Corps, I think. 
Uh, it has these tilt rotors, okay, so it has these huge propellers, and they can tilt up, and then it can take off vertically like a helicopter, and then at some point, you know, it can fly like an airplane too. So the trick is, once it takes off, you know, you got to tilt these things forward and get it moving forward, and you got to do that just right, or it's going to fall to the ground, right? So it's really tricky, and it's all controlled by software, of course. Uh, and this one, when they were testing it, there were a lot of problems, okay? People, there were crashes, and pilots were killed, and some of those were blamed on uh, the software, okay? Okay. And I'm sure you can point to other examples. It's not hard to find these things. Uh, okay, so uh, software, uh, when you think about it, you know, ordinary users, uh, just people who know nothing about computers, you know, they actually get pretty good at dealing with software and its, you know, its quirks and its flaws and its problems. Um, they have to, okay, because it's in order to survive. So, okay, an ordinary user, you know, you use the software and you do find bugs, you find flaws, you find problems. You don't go out and search for these things, they just show up and they kind of annoy you. But you probably hate it, you know, maybe not enough to get rid of your Windows computer, but you hate you know, the bugs that you find in your software. But you learn to live with it, okay? because you really have to, okay? because it's just it's so prevalent. Okay? Uh, so you have to make it work somehow. Okay, now look at it from the perspective of uh, Trudy. Okay, so how does Trudy view this situation? There are lots of bugs out there. Okay, so what's Trudy going to do? Search. Search for them, okay? They're actually a good thing, okay, from her perspective, okay? Because each bug is, you know, something the software's not supposed to be doing that it could potentially do, and that's a potential avenue of attack for Trudy. So instead of just finding these by accident, she's going to go out and look for them, you know, vigorously. And she loves bad software, okay? This is a potential avenue of attack uh, into a system. Uh, and once you find the bad software, you can try to uh, abuse the software and make it misbehave. And so, you know, potentially we can get attacks on systems through bad software, as we'll see here uh, coming up. Okay, I love this quote. I've probably said this a couple times already. Uh, but uh, complexity is the enemy of security. Okay. okay, so complexity in terms of software. Well, you know, the complexity of software, you can sort of crudely measure by the number of lines of code in the software. Okay, so how many lines of code are there? Well, look at some large systems. Uh, Netscape, 17 million lines. The Space Shuttle, 10 million lines. Uh, Windows XP, four times as complex as the Space Shuttle, at least according to some measure here. Uh, those are a lot of lines of code. Okay, but the point here really is that that's so much code, there's no one person who can possibly understand Windows XP. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's just too much. No one developer could get his mind around anywhere near that number of lines of code. So the complexity of, of large software systems is just far outstripped, you know, humans' ability to even comprehend. Okay, so when you have that level of complexity, you have to expect there's going to be flaws at some level, okay? There's just no way you're going to eliminate those flaws. So, okay, so we'll get to that. Okay, and I like this too. Uh, a new car today contains more lines of code than was required to land the Apollo astronauts on the moon. Okay, so complexity is growing. It's a constantly uh, increasing thing as far as software goes. Uh, okay, so what does this mean? Uh, so, you know, software's huge number of lines of code, very complex systems. There are bugs, right? Um, you know, at least in your code. You know, when I write the code, I have no bugs. But you know, when you guys write code, okay, you know, these bugs. okay how many bugs? Well, uh, you know, there's all sorts of estimates if you look out there. They're sort of all over the field. But you know, a conservative estimate would be five bugs per 10,000 10, lines of code. Okay, so let's just do the math. Okay, let's just uh, throw some numbers out here. Uh, suppose you have a computer which has 3,000 executable files, each with the equivalent of, say, 100,000 lines of code you know, per executable. Okay, so that gives you 50 bugs per uh, executable file, uh, and so about 150,000 bugs on your computer. Well, that's bad. That sounds bad. Okay, but let's ramp it up a little bit. Suppose you work for uh, you know, a medium-sized company, and they have a network that has 30,000 machines on it. That's not unreasonable, okay? 30,000 computers, uh, 150,000 bugs per computer on their network, on their corporate network, there's 4.5 billion bugs. 
my God, it's an enormous number. Well, hold on. Okay, so, you know, I mean, that's a huge number. And now, suppose uh, not all of those are going to be security related issues or even have anything to do with security or any potential problems at all. So let's suppose only 10% of those have any potential security uh, uh, you know, issues at all. And maybe only 10% of those are things that would be remotely exploitable, things that would potentially cause you know, the worst sort of problems. So only 1% of those are you know, really security issues. So only 4.5 million security flaws on your corporate network. What to worry about? Yeah. I don't know about the numbers, but wouldn't it saying 30,000 times 150K mean each machine is unique and its bugs are unique from the other machines? Yeah, OK, so that's a good point. I mean, they're certainly not unique, right? I mean, you have you know, a lot of the same software. So there's a lot of overlap. So you know, this, there's a lot of duplicates here. Okay, amongst those 4.5 million, how many unique bugs? A lot less than 4.5 million. But still, if someone finds a way to attack one of those bugs, is it better or worse that they're on all your computers or not? Well, wouldn't it be um, better for Trudy to have like only the 15,000 bugs to search, but they're on each computer, than to have to search 4.5 million? Well, okay, the point isn't really that Trudy has to search for all of these. She just has to find one. It's sort of the other way around. If you want to prevent her attacks, you have to find them all. <laughs> okay, and you have to patch these problems. Trudy only needs one, and she's happy, right? So it's very asymmetrical, right? I mean, you know, all the advantages here. It's almost like the it's like password guessing sorts of stuff and those other sort of mathematical arguments we did. Only way worse. Okay, all the advantages here lie with the attackers. Uh, okay, so in this chapter, chapter 11, uh, there's two, two topics. We're actually going to cover almost all of chapter 11. We'll skip, we'll cover a few things in chapter 12 and maybe just a little bit of chapter 13. But this chapter, we do most of it. Uh, two major topics here are uh, program flaws and malware. So both you know, software-related things. One is sort of unintentional uh, attacks through software, and the other is very intentional uh, attacks via software. Okay, first of all, the program flaws. Um, uh, we're going to cover the buffer overflow in excruciating detail, but the other two we'll probably skip just to save a little bit of time. Okay, buffer overflow is certainly the most uh, important uh, of the three here. Okay, we'll kind of skip over to this quickly. Go. Okay. Um, you know, in, in software engineering or just developing software in general, and you're given some sort of problem that you're supposed to solve, right? So you have some, some problem to solve. So you're writing software to, you know, uh, do a payroll or something like that, whatever. Okay, so you have to solve the problem that you're uh, given. Now, if you're trying to develop secure software, you still have to solve the problem that you're given. Okay, you don't have any choice about that. You're trying to develop an application to do something. But if it's going to be secure, you have to do what is intended and nothing more. So it's sort of those unintended features, okay, that Trudy would try to exploit. So how do you, you know, it's hard enough to test your software to make sure it does what is intended. How do you test your software to make sure it does nothing more? That's a pretty big category, right? So you really can't test for everything more that it could possibly do. Okay, so how do you even deal with that? So, you know, the bottom line really is that making your software sort of absolutely secure is going to be impossible, okay? So that's kind of a downer in a sense, but, you know, if you think about it, in real life, almost nothing is absolutely secure. You can't guarantee security. The best you can hope to do is sort of reduce the likelihood of some problem or some attack, okay? So that's what we'll, the way we'll have to think about this. You know, so what can we do to manage the risks or to minimize the risks uh, inherent in using software? Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, again, the flaws we're talking about here are unintentional things. Okay. It's not malware. It's not somebody trying to be malicious. It's someone trying to develop software, do the right thing, but somehow they put something in the software that potentially truly can attack. Uh, and we'll, uh, again, only look at the buffer overflow. Uh, and there's actually several different variations on this. The one that we'll look at is sometimes referred to as uh, smashing the stack because it deals with the uh, stack-based overflows. Uh, 